Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Eric Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. generations. Sometimes it's hard to have the second, third, fourth, but here today I have someone who's in the fifth generation of real estate with an unbelievable family history who's also the chairman of Newmark Knight Grub Frank, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, and also the owner of three racetracks, including the Meadowlands. I'm happy to have Jeff Gorrell. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you. So let's go back. Talk about your great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. Tell well, me about him. I don't know that much about him other than what I read, but uh, other than the fact that when I had a beard, I looked just like him. Uh, he came over like, I, I believe it was 1881. Uh, well, I know that uh, it was around that time. And, and he, his name was? Jacob Rabinowitz. Jacob Rabinowitz, and he, he was a tobacco trader. And he came over here, and then he went into the wine Trade right, business. at a liquor store, I think. A right. liquor store down in the Lower East Side. That's correct. He, he really was a philanthropist like you are, and what he did was he and these nine gentlemen created a Lonsman Association because one of their people who came over with them uh, had died at Ellis Island, and they created Hayes, the Hebrew Immigration Society, uh, where they would find jobs and help people and give money to these people. And he became a very successful entrepreneur over the year. Then let's go to the next generation. Uh, my grandmother had uh, three brothers who, who were uh, Aaron Rabinowitz, who ended up owning and running Fred F. French Company, which became a public company, uh, uh, became a REIT. And then Leon and Maurice Spear, who we all know had Spear and Company, which ultimately merged into Harry Helmsley's operation. Now, and the, which is really interesting because Aaron really followed Grandpa. He was also a major philanthropist involved with so many charitable endeavors. But the the interesting situation with uh, you know with with your your grandfather Aaron um, was that he. He got involved with uh, the Fred French Company originally, and the Fred French Company, um, and he built Knickerbocker Village, Tudor City, Tudor City, and Knickerbocker vi Village, uh, which which remain things. But he, in his obituary, there was something written that the most he was more proud about the building of the amalgamated housing for the low cost cooperative housing which really, you know, made a unique situation. Right. And his brothers were, as you said, 
Leon Spear uh, of Spear and Company, mm -hmm. which subsequently later on in your life you did some business over there. Oh yeah, uh, a matter of fact, amazingly, Leon Spear sold me a building when he was 92 years old, 661st Avenue, and his mind was sharp as a tack, and he he was selling buildings and doing brokerage right to the very end, and and he lived into into all of them, Le Leon Aaron. Rabinowitz and Maurice Spear, they all lived into their 90s. So, so let's talk about your dad, the late Aaron Gorel. How, you, tell me a little bit about that. My dad really was from the, from the black sheep of the family because of the five children that Jacob Rabinowitz had. My, my grandmother, Rose, uh, married some near-do-well or whatever who ended up leaving the family, you know, and so she was a single mo single mother, and she raised my father. And uh, and uh, he had a brother who worked on the for the Santa Fe Railroad. Ended up living in San Francisco and, and a sister. And then he had these very successful three uncles, and uh, and his aunt married a judge and lived in in Cedarhurst. So my grandmother was really the black sheep of the family. My father grew up in the Depression. And he tells stories how he sold ice creams. When people came off the George Washington Bridge, he had an ice cream, you know, one of those things. And I think he was there on the, when the George Washington Bridge opened because he lived in Washington Heights. And, and his first, I know he graduated, he went to Dewey Clinton, uh, and he graduated NYU, and I think he was 20. He graduated two years early as an accountant. And the only job he could get was reading water meters, water meters, and electric meters for Spear and Company. And I think with Alvin Schwartz, wh who married one of the Spear daughters, and and Alvin became one of the major real estate owners. Was Helmsley one, Spear? Helmsley Spear was was partners with Irving Schneider and Harry. So, so how did your father go from reading meters to to getting into? this little company, Newmark, and the guy was dead at this time, I mean. No, my father, my father then, I think, worked at Spear and Company and then went out on his own and was a, was a broker, mainly in the garment center. He had a couple of, of clients and he subsequently, he and I think six other brokers uh, were employed by Harris Newmark, was the name of the company. And Harris and Newmark had a fight, so Harris left, and there was Dave Newmark, uh, and he had these, there were seven brokers, of which my father was the number one broker. And when Dave... But they were, they were really uh, loft brokers, right? Yeah. And yeah. Garment Center. Garment Center, West Side brokers. Absolutely. Loft brokers, uh, you know, my father broke, sold buildings in the Lower East Side, you know, the small buildings. It was not a big... Uh, and when Dave New when he, when Newmark retired, he sold the business to the seven 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 people, of which my father was the number one producer. Uh, producer. So he had the biggest share, and he was the chairman of the company. And over time, four of the younger people left, uh, including Sidney Winokur, who's still alive, who f ultimately founded uh, Winokur, and a couple of other uh, a guy named Bob Abrams, and then. Uh, Jerry Handler was there, his, his hand drove realty, and, uh, it Jack ended up, and Jack Schenker. So it ended up there were three people left, my father, Jack Schenker, and Jerry Handler. So how did your father get into the, the ownership of buildings? My father and his, they, he tried to buy buildings a little bit, and uh, uh, he, owned, he owned, they bought 639th Avenue, uh, they bought 235th Avenue with a bunch of partners. Uh, they bought, uh, then he bought his, his uncle, uh, at, at Fred F. French, uh, gave him a leg up and, and net leased him 515 Madison Avenue, which was uh, a building on the corner of 53rd that was owned by the, the, the family. The, and uh, he gave my father a, 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 what looked like a good deal turned out to be uh, there was some some escalations that percentage rents that didn't that who envisioned that Madison Avenue rents could be sixty and seventy dollars so uh, it turned out to be good for everybody and um, 
he acquired, you know, he had, a, he had a building, I wish we still owned it, that he was so happy to sell down the terminal warehouse uh, down on 12th, between 11th and 12th Avenue, which is right across from, uh, I think... Uh, Starrett Lehigh Building. Starrett Lehigh, right. Whoever thought that, you know, uh, <coughs> I think my father sold the building for 12 or $13 million and he came home with that check. It was the highlight of his life. And... Uh, here we are that, uh, you know. So talk about you. You were born in uh, 1942. 42. My mother died three years later in childbirth. And uh, obviously it was wartime. They didn't have doctors and uh, probably would have never died today. But medicine wasn't great. My father married, uh, remarried about two years later. Uh, in that time, I lived with my grandmother in Washington Heights. And... Uh, uh, my father remarried, and then we moved to Queens. And then ultimately, when uh, when I was in the fourth grade, I know we moved out to to Hewlett in the Five Towns. Now, which is interesting because your great grandfather they used to live out in in the in the Five Towns and the Rockaway neighborhood going yeah. back years ago. Right. Because they were part of the Rockaway Club. Well, uh, you know, what it ended up that way, but uh, we moved out there, and then. Uh, and then when I was 13, we moved to, to Woodmere. My father was making a few dollars, and we moved to the high-rent district, what would be the high, you know. What, but I remember, I think the house cost like $13,000. Now, now, when you were growing up, you had an interest in architecture, right? Engineering, civil engineering. I had an interest in construction. That's what I wanted. I wanted to go into construction. Whenever I would watch, see a house being built or a building being built, I used to sit on the curb and watch that that construction, so that, that fascinated me. And uh, Did you ever go to work with your dad when, uh, when you were a kid? No. My dad, when I was in high school, uh, he, would get make, he would get me a job as, run, as an elevator operator. So uh, if you remember back then, elevator operators were common. Most elevators were not ma right. were manual. So I would work, for, I would fill in for the summer vacation guys and uh, he would find a job for me and I would work uh, running an elevator. And then uh, my last year, he got me a job with one of his tenants who was an engineering firm. I worked in the mail room and then I went off to college. So where'd you go to school? I went to uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and got a degree in civil engineering. And then you move, uh, you go to the West Coast, right? I got out, I wanted to go into construction, and every place I went, they said, do you have any experience? I said, no. They said, well, we can't hire you. In those days, there was no construction courses. I didn't take any construction courses. So uh, on a whim, I went with a friend of mine who was going to Stanford, and I said, would you keep me company? I'll dr let's drive across country, and I'll drop you, you know, and, and, you know, we took a slow drive. We stopped at some of the sightseeing places, and we ended up in Los Angeles, and uh, Lo and behold, when I got there, I picked up the paper and I saw all these advertisements for civil engineers. And I went on, a, a, the first interview I went on was with the state of California. And the guy said, oh, well, Mr. Garrow, we consider an education from an Eastern college far superior f from the education you get here in California. And we'd, we would love to have you. And, and it was a two-year training program which really was what attracted me. Uh, and you said you got involved with, besides building, you got involved with uh, road building. Yeah, I worked for the California Division of Highways, and every six months I had a different job, and uh, I called my girlfriend, uh, and I told her I had a job, and asked if she would marry me over the phone, and uh, she said yes, and she flew out with her mother, and uh, we got married, and we're still married <laughs> for 49 years later. So. You're in California. How do you come back east? Oh, it was easy. I, I, I really didn't like Los Angeles, to be honest. Um, but since I couldn't get a job in New York, what choice did I have? And I felt uh, that I had two years' experience working for the California Division of Highways. So when the two years was up, um, and by then I had had a, a daughter, so uh, my parents were anxious for me to move back. So. Uh, got on a plane and, and moved back, back east so and went to look for a job. job. How did you get the job with Morse Diesel? Actually, I got the job because um, uh, 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 
Aaron Rabinowitz's son-in-law, uh, Fred, Fred of French, had used um, uh, was it called diesel construction at the time. They had built uh, a building for them on Second Avenue, I think, and he was nice enough to get me an interview. And this time I had experience, so they hired me, and they put they assigned me to, uh, to on a job as an assistant super on Staten Island. And from Staten Island, how did you get to build in New York City? <clears throat> from Staten Island, I, I, they moved me to 437 Madison Avenue, and uh, that was a, a building that was going to be built by the Kaufman Weiler uh, organization. And uh, I was there from the demolition. Uh, the building which is across from the uh, Hemsley Hotel. Yeah, the Archdiocese, right. And I was there from the demolition, the excavation, the, the whole thing, the tenant work. Uh, I got friendly with Mel Kaufman and Bob Kaufman, and uh, I was there from start to finish. So whenever I drive by that building, I have a special place in my heart for that building. You also built another building. Weren't you involved? With I was involved as a project manager. After, after I finished that, they brought me into the office and made me a project manager. So I was the project manager on 645 Madison. Uh, and then I was also the project manager on a building in Harlem because I was the local liberal in the office. I had long hair and uh, me and Douglas Durst were the liberals around town. And uh, it was a challenge because the state office building had gone up and there had been a lot of turmoil with the community because in those days the labor unions were all white. There were, there were no African American employees. It was all white, Italian. Uh, but almost no African Americans and no women. And uh, the owner of, of the site had signed a lease with the city of New York. It was Presidential Realty, who also owned 645 Madison. And they had to have the building built by a certain date or the city could cancel the lease. So my job was to get that building built with, without having turmoil with the, with the, with the community. And, so and how, how do you decide to leave Morse Diesel and get uh, Diesel? and get involved directly in the real estate business? I had no interest in going into the real estate business. My father and his partners would take me to lunch every year, and I said, I'm not interested. I love construction. Probably the 60 East Club also. You know, we used to go to the NYU <coughs> Club, which was in... Uh, in Town Hall. You got it, exactly. That's where we... Because we were on West Side, guys. Uh, my father had a membership there, that, and he went to NYU, and that's where we went. And um, at, I loved working at, at Morris Diesel. Uh, all of the top people su uh, subsequently in the industry really worked there. Erwin uh, Miller, who ran Tishman, Peter Lira, Gene McGovern, Artie Nussbaum ran HRH. I got a great education. Uh, and I owned a small car Morse, uh, gave everybody stock in the company, everyone he liked, you know, his key people. And he told everybody, I'm going to sell the company, I'm going to make everybody rich. Lo and behold, he sells the company to a company called ARA Services, which was a food service company which made no sense whatsoever. And I also had a bad feeling because we were building so many buildings. On Water Street alone, I think we were building seven buildings, and none of them had tenants. And I felt something bad is going to happen in, the, in this business. It's going gonna, it's gonna to slow down. And I really didn't want to work for a public company. I, I really thought, well, if I stay here, work hard, and I could become a chairman. Vice president. Of, yeah, I can work my way up. And, and Peter Lira and I were that we each had, I worked for Irwin, Peter worked for, for Harold Schiff. Uh, so my father finally convinced me that I should give it real estate a try, and that's what happened. So during that period of time, <coughs> Newmark, which at that time was considered this West Side loft guys, you and your father, and then f your father met this young leasing guy by the name of Barry Gosson. Jack Schenker, actually, we, 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 Jack ran a building at 235th Avenue, which was the Lamp Building. In those days, they had these showroom buildings. And one day, he comes to my father and I, and he says, you know, this, these young guys are stealing all my tenants. We ought to meet with them. And it was Barry Gosson and Harvey Richer. And my father and I met with them, and we bought their company for not a lot of money. It was, times weren't great then, either. And so we, want, we had some young guys in the company. Um, and that really turned out to be a pivotal decision in my career uh, because Barry uh, 
Barry wanted to be rich and successful and be a big big shot broker. And I really... You wanted to run buildings. I wanted to run buildings, and I was doing these what they called J51 conversions. So I was buying... Uh, I, would, I bought a couple of warehouse buildings down in... Uh, uh, in the West Village, converted them to condom to co-ops. I bought a garage on Third Street. I bought, and I was having a good time. Uh, and Barry came along, and, and Barry said, "We gotta, I want to, we gotta start buying buildings ourselves." And that's what we did. And and our focus was on buying buildings. Fortunately, and in those days, you could buy a building for you know everything. And you bought a lot of buildings on the West Side. We bought we bought buildings. Really, where now are the fashionable buildings? We we bought uh, some buildings on the west side. We we bought buildings. We bought buildings on Eighth Avenue. Uh, we bought two build a couple buildings in Soho. We bought a building in the Village. An Astor the Lower place. Side also. We I bought a building in Tribeca. Tribeca and then and, and uh, now those are the buildings that are you know popular. But we we really specialized in buying buildings that were manufacturing, where we would we would gradually over time convert them to more office. office right and you also bought the flat iron we bought the flat iron jimmy kuhn came a look came in uh, uh, uh came in with us we uh, barry uh when the real estate crashed if in you the remember, early 90s right we were in trouble because uh the, the, the government screwed up you know they 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 changed the rules Tax it was, law, right. yeah it was stupid so uh Barry said to me, "Let's let's let me try going out and and doing brokerage as much as because he really wanted to be a, a, a great broker, but because we couldn't buy anything because we were the banks were telling us we have to pay them back and we were saying how are we going to do that? No one wants to lend us money. You couldn't. There was a time you couldn't borrow a penny. So Barry, we sublet some space on Madison Avenue for like five dollars a foot, and we hired a bunch of senior brokers, guys who were kind of past their prime maybe." Uh, Arthur Lerner, Arthur Rosenblum, and uh, Ronnie Goldberger, who just passed away, because uh, Barry worked at, 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 in, at Edward S. Gordon, so he knew uh, Ro uh, Rosenblum and all these guys. Uh, these right. guys, and we built Barry built up a, a brokerage <coughs> business, and uh, and that's and that worked. You know, so, well, let's. There's another career which you've spent a, a number of the past ten years or even longer, um, and. You, you said when you were growing up as a kid, you liked going to racetracks. You liked going to the, the tracks. Well, I grew up near Roosevelt Raceway and Aqueduct in Belmont. And in those days, racing was very popular. Believe it or not, horse racing was the number one spectator sport in America back in the 60s. And my friends and I, we used to go to the track all the time. And as a result, you feel like, gee, it'd be nice to own a horse. I would get inside so information. So when did you buy a horse? When was I bought a horse, and one day I was at Roosevelt Raceway, and I, I see a guy who works at Diesel Construction, Don Pizer. And I said, well, what are you doing here? He says, I love horse racing. I didn't know that he liked horse racing. I, and I said, great. I said, gee, I'd love to own a horse. He said, okay, I know someone who's a trainer. I'll call you up. We'll buy a horse. And we bought a horse. This was probably in the early 70s. And from there, I owned a bunch of horses and, and you know, had some success, mainly failures, lost money. Everybody will tell you that. Uh, I stayed interested. I kind of got out of it when I got busy in the real estate business. And then one day I, I was involved in a building on 34th Street. Uh, I was partners with Arthur Cohn and Sam Zell. And uh, we were forced to sell it. Uh, the fee, it was a net lease. The fee was bought by somebody uh, who will remain nameless who tried to immediately start a lawsuit. To, and then Bernie Mendick came to the rescue and, and called, called us up and said, guys, I know you're not getting along. You have a war here. Would, would you be willing to, s I can make a deal to buy the fee if you'll sell me the lease. And we decided, Sam Zell, Arthur, we said, okay, it's not worth the aggravation. We'll sell it, which, and I, and I said, I said to myself, you know what? I, this was so aggravating. I'm going to take my share of the profit and I'm going to buy a horse farm in upstate New York. I'm going to buy a horse farm. And I ran into a guy, an electrician named Charlie Salzauer, who, who said, I have a horse farm upstate. He invited me up for a weekend. I w it was beautiful. I realized he didn't know, particularly know what he was doing, which meant that I didn't have to worry because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and I took that, that money and bought a farm in, in Dutchess County near Charlie's. 
and I st started raising horses. And so then, then how do you go into oh, buying a racetrack? Well, horse racing became a dying business, truthfully, and the only thing that would keep it afloat was going to be if we could convince the government to allow us to have uh, slot machines. That racinos. Was racinos. And I had become involved politically. I'm a, I'm a major Democrat. I do a lot of fundraising. And I was able to get us a meeting with Shelley Silver. Uh, and he said, he, he said, if you can show me that it'll make a billion dollars for the state, which is what it makes today, uh, I'll support it because he, want, he was big in education because most of the money goes for education. So you, you have two horse tracks before we get to the Meadowlands. So I ended up, my wife <laughs> said, why are you doing all of this? You don't own any tracks. And to make a long story short, I ended up owning two tracks, Tioga Downs and Vernon Downs. And Which are state. upstate. Correct. So how do you decide to get involved with the Meadowlands? Well, the Meadowlands is the number one harness track in the world. And Christy gets elected. And correctly, the state of New Jersey owns these tracks, and they're losing a lot of money. They own the Meadowlands and Monmouth. And Christie forms a commission to decide what to do. And the commission says, well, we've got to get out of the racetrack business. We should sell the Meadowlands, close it, move the harness guys over to Monmouth and, and sell Monmouth. And at the time, we were getting $30 million a year was going from Atlantic City to the racetracks in exchange for them not asking to get casino gambling, as, as they had in New York and Pennsylvania. And Christie said, I've got to resurrect Atlantic City. I'm taking that $30 million, giving it back to Atlantic City to use for marketing. And I didn't think much of it. I thought, well, you know, this will have legislative hearings and, you know, maybe someday. And a friend of mine said, I uh, mentioned that he knew Christie, and I said, could you get me a meeting with him? I want to see what's, what's going on. He said, sure, call up. I call up the guy, says, oh, it's good that you call. We're going to close it tonight. And I said, what? He said, yeah, we're going to announce it's closing. If you're interested in, in, in taking over, get down here by the end of the day with a check for $6 million, and we'll keep it open so for nothing. you bought it? No. So I said, are you crazy? I'm not coming. I don't know anything about it. I'm not coming down there with $6 million. So ultimately, I actually got friendly with the people in the administration. They checked me out. They found out I was actually a legitimate Real you estate guy, I wasn't right. some fly by <laughs> night. And I became, I got to meet the governor, and I made a deal. When did you take over the Meadowlands? We, we took it over um, last, a year ago in January, January 1st, 2012. Uh, I took it over. And there, were, there was a period where I was running it with the state, but, by, but we closed on and, January 1st. And later on in the year, you're going to have a new... Um, we, we, part of the deal with, with that I made was that I would build a new grandstand, because the facility that's there was built for a different generation, a different era. Uh, they used to get crowds of 20,000 people on a, right. on a normal Saturday, <coughs> and now most of the wagering at a racetrack is done someplace else. It's done off track. So, so, so it's, it's interesting, you know, with the great, uh, and you are a major philanthropist yourself, following the traditions of uh, Jacob and Aaron, and uh, you're a major race owner of facilities and new marketing company, new mark grub night frank and everything else and i'd like to thank you for being here today well thank you for having me i, I appreciate it